um, professor of Russian studies, Stetson University, Atlanta, Florida, and I'm joined uh, in the Skype call uh, by Renee Stillings. Renee has been the CEO of SRAS um, for about 25 years now. SRAS is our partner in all things study abroad. Um, it is an organization uh, devoted to improving ties between educational establishments in the United States and Russia in a myriad of ways, including study abroad. Uh, but I'm actually talking with Renee today less about study abroad explicitly, but instead um, I'm going to ask her some questions about um, the importance of uh, aptitude in speaking, understanding, uh, expressing oneself in Russian in the vast area that we at Spree's here at Stetson cover, which is essentially everything east of the Oder and west of the Pacific. So that's a big area. Um, and Renee has spent significant time in uh, the Spree's area and spends, I don't know, three or four months a year at least traveling in, in our area. Um, and um, she uh, actually is um, a, a biomedical engineer by training. She's from Minnesota. Um, I'll let her talk about why she got interested in the Soviet Union and its successor state, the Russian Federation. Um, she's, uh, like I said, been the CEO of SRAS for 25 years, and she's owned a lot of different businesses in Russia, um, in, including some consultancies that have worked extensively with Russian businesses. So basically, uh, she's seen 25 years of what it of the business cycles, business life in the Russian Federation and in the Spree's area more broadly. And so I wanted to ask you today, Renee, if you'd say a few words about um, how aptitude in Russian figures into the careers of um, of, of of people working, of, of, of expats, of uh, citizens of the U.S. working in Russia and more broadly in the Spree's area. Okay, great. Well, my my background is is uh, probably you know may or may not be as exotic as many of those who found their career related to Russia. But I grew up in Minnesota, uh, western of Minneapolis, and kind of blew through all the, the Spanish and German uh, options available to me at that time, and wanted to study a bit of Russian. Then actually had been at an AIFS. Uh, my a AFS meeting where they were recruiting, and of course, in, in our neck of the woods, everybody goes to Sweden and Norway. And I sort of raised my hand and said, I'd like to go to the USSR. And at which point they looked at me and said, you can't do that, uh, which is exactly the wrong thing to say to me. And so I went and bought myself a little penguin book of Russian, went to my local library, got some phonographs that dates me right there, um, listened to those. And every bit of, that I could, I looked like a little spy in training in my bedroom growing up. Uh, so that you know, took me to college where I actually studied engineering, which if you think it's difficult now trying to study abroad as an engineer, try it back then. Uh, I think there was maybe one option for something in Sweden, I think maybe in English for engineers. But I did manage to sneak in some Russian and the first opportunity I could take um, was uh, right after graduation to jump on a program for two months in Moscow. Um, like most study abroad experiences, those that changes your life, you meet some people, um, you like, do things you want to do and what you wanted to not do uh, right at the moment in time of a engineering, I say re recession, 1990 recession, which of course affected engineers because it was the end of the Cold War. So our thoughts, you know, as a, in, in our field, I could either sit and push papers at the VA or something like this, or I could just go do something else. So I, just, I chose to do something else and return to, to Russia eventually after getting a little bit of experience in the, in the translation, uh, translation world. So what I, I saw was sort of a, a trajectory over many years now, 25 years at least of uh, well, more, so SRES is 25, so I figure at least 30 years of time spent in that region and seeing the cycles of what young people can and cannot do in the region. And while we had a period of the crazy cowboy days of, of the 90s where I mean, if you walked on two legs, you could breathe and you spoke English and you knew a little bit of Russian, you, you suddenly found yourself like the VP of marketing or something like this in, in an area where uh, admittedly Russians didn't have experience yet. Um, so a lot of that was happening. Um, but then, you know, what happens is you hit a couple of financial crises and all along this way, the Russians themselves were 
gaining education and exposure. And they're perfectly capable right now of covering just about every position that needs to be covered within Russia, albeit we still have some crazy American entrepreneurs still still doing things. Um, but the, the, net, the net result is that the job market really has, has shifted in a way where you're not going to necessarily just land there and suddenly find an entry-level job or any sort of job easily without having qualifications. And so those qualifications are twofold. It's you know, having some experience in, in practical applications, you know, whether it's in economics, political science, any, any area like this, but also relative fluency of the Russian language. Enough Russians speak English at this point where you need to keep pace and speak Russian well. And well, on one hand, I, I would say that any experience that you can get traveling abroad into that region, is, it's all valuable. I don't care if you can get a week snuck in somewhere over spring break. Every little piece is another experience, another thing to see. If you plan well, you can learn a lot. But you know, to actually achieve a level of fluency, it's, it's more than just the classroom. It's an extended period of time, not only in a teaching situation in a Russian-speaking country, but it's what that extended period of time allows you. It allows you the additional exposure over, say, a semester period of time to meet those Russian friends, because that's where you're going to learn the Russian language. It's in all the conversations that you have with now some very good friends that you spend your evenings with. You may even end up you know, moving with them at some point, hanging out. And that, unfortunately, doesn't happen usually in a one-week experience or a few weeks here or there in the country. It's, it's something that's built up over a longer period of time. And I think that's really the, the, the biggest part of what a long-term study abroad experience can bring to you is the, is the connections. As, as Michael mentioned, I have a lot of experience with some other businesses I was involved with, including a consulting firm. And you know, it was funny because when one of the first crises hit in, I guess, August of 98, everything happens in August in Russia. And you know, we, we had this scratching our head moment. At the time, we were more involved more with the financial markets, and we're like, okay, what do we do? You know, we're, we're expats, at least some of us were. We could leave, we could go somewhere else, um, try to make our fortunes in some other country, maybe ideally a warmer one, you know, with nice beaches and cocktails, things like this. But, but yeah, after thinking about it, we realized that, and this is important too, that it's not only about the language. We had spent years building up a business and social infrastructure that would help us to navigate whatever it was we wanted to do. And that was that really is what would take so much more time to replicate in any other place that we would go. Um, just building up the local knowledge, how things work, how they don't work, the psychology of the people, um, a network of people you can turn to for how do I get this done? These are so many of these countries are about uh, there. You know, we hear this all the time. They're less about structure and rule of law. It's about who, you know. And it really is because you first thought in a place like Russia when you don't know how to do something is who do I know who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who can help me get this done. So it, it's really imperative to build up that network, which is, is what takes time. So we, we stuck it out, which was you know, the, the right choice because a lot of our competition left, uh, leaving us there with, you know, in, in a fairly good position and the knowledge <coughs> excuse me, that we'd accumulated. And I think that that's really the, the key is to, you know, Again, take whatever opportunity you can you can to to visit other places, you know, to get around Russia, to get around the, the Russian speaking part of the world, but make sure to also fit in a solid chunk of time to really build a network, build an infrastructure and build the language skills that can only happen over over an extended period. I have a, I have a question, uh, Renee. So you've been you studied Russia, you speak Russian, 25 years working um, with educational establishments. What's the best way to improve fluency in Russian? I hate to say the first thing that comes to mind because it's usually said by the male half of the population, which is <laughs> to find yourself a Russian girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As one, one guy used to call it, a, uh, to translate into English, you know, a dictionary in a skirt. Um, but that's, you know, we, we find these sort of things in, in Russia. But that, that is the key. I mean, I, you know, not exactly that key, but yeah, the minute you have the time to make some really good friends that you suddenly just have regular conversations with, you're going out with them, talking about things that are not just textbook conversations, that's suddenly where your language develops in leaps and bounds in terms of the casual conversation where you pick up the, you know, for good or for bad, because you do want to sort of pick your friends a little bit because you will pick up their speaking habits. Yeah. So you'll start noticing they'll use their same crutch words 
some of their same slang. So, you know, sometimes in the, in the, in a certain... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, so it's, it's something to, that it's fun to observe that, though, when that happened, because you realize that, well, I'm getting so comfortable with this that I'm picking up the speech patterns um, yeah. to a degree. But yeah, you just want to make sure whose speech patterns you're picking up. Yeah, the, it's, it's, I'll just say that it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how uh, stratified or local knowledge is. And I was just talking with a friend, and I'm far more comfortable um, analyzing and discussing futurist poetry than I am talking about movies or whatever, um, because mm -hmm. that, that's me, right? I mean, that's what I, that's, that's, that the people I know um, it, who speak Russian, when, when I talk with them, it's, I talk about like literature and, and, and music and art, um, very, very, uh, a, a, and, um, I, I actually have, that, that's far easier for me than to talk about, um, I don't know who, who won the latest football game, but like, but, but your, 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 your network really matters. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm very comfortable, for example, I mean, I've slipped away a little bit from it now, but, you know, reading contracts or speaking of contracts yeah. or financial terms and give me a history text and or even a children's book and I get I start tripping up over it. So it's it's really is. And I think this also plays well to, you know, one of the other benefits of, of a longer period of study abroad is that you know, we suggest it really encourages this of all students, which is to get involved with the things you normally are involved with back at home. If you like to lift weights, do yoga, play Absolutely. baseball play hockey, sing in a choir, whatever it is, this is the easiest way to develop relationships and the language related to the things you enjoy doing already. So I think this is a key. The, peop the people you know matter. Yep. Uh, thanks a lot, Renee, for talking to us a little bit about studying Russian, learning Russian, and uh, um, it, its importance for anybody um, seeking a career in that part of the world. You just I, I just, you just can't, you can't, you can't want to work in that part of the world and not speak Russian well. It's just very difficult. Uh, la last question, ready? Uh, the, what's the one, it's easy to always talk about the, the, the best thing to do. What's the worst thing that you see students do who want to study Russian and are studying abroad? Uh, meaning, meaning worse than they can do when they're abroad, I would say, is to place themselves into entirely a bubble, um, a bubble of, of other foreigners and, and not seek out opportunities to break to break out of that. It's, yeah. that's, that's a dangerous thing, particularly in a location that might not be naturally as immersive. Uh, for example, St. Petersburg, it's kind of easy to be lazy there if you wanted to. There's going to be a lot of foreigners around. Um, on top of it, the city is sort of designed to be welcoming the tourists with, you know, every restaurant you go into, you could ask for the English menu. You can navigate the metro now in English. Um, you know, you have to really, you know, we, we do from our side what we can to try to prevent this from happening and matching students with peers and making sure that those, those relationships are kickstarted quite a bit, quite a bit earlier. But it's, it's something that students who maybe feel that they maybe inherently are that lazy, um, of which there are many people like this, and that's not, you know, it's just it's the way it is, maybe to challenge yourself by choosing a location where that's not as likely to happen. Great. Thank you very much, Renee. Have a great day. I'm going to hang up the, let's stop recording, but we'll, we'll keep talking. All right.